Amen. Amen. Thank you. All right, the title for the lesson today is, Which Are You, a Vessel of Honor or Dishonor? And I'm picking up from the uh, message that Pastor Mark gave actually a month ago today. It was on February 27th that he spoke to us about vessels of honor and dishonor. And, you know, when he first told me that he was looking to, to preach on that topic, I sort of cringed, okay? So, oh, that, that's going to be, um, wow, that's, that, that could be difficult. And, you know, it's one of these things that it, it really struck me, and I, I, couldn't, I couldn't shake it. And I just kept meditating on that. Um, and it's interesting, there's also another... Uh, a verse in Romans that speaks to vessels of honor and vessels of dishonor. Um, and uh, what you're going to hear today is really what, um, what the Lord has sort of revealed to me about this topic of vessels of honor and dishonor. So if you want to turn uh, to 2 Timothy 2, 20 and 21, that's uh, really what the heart of this message is going to be about. And then uh, the only other place that I'm going to go, if you want to put uh, uh, your thumb there or um, a bookmark, is going to be in Galatians 5, uh, 16 to, to 25. But um, so I'm going to start by reading uh, the verse that Pastor Mark had spoken to. But in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay, some for honor, some for dishonor. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from the latter, he will be a vessel for honor, sanctified and useful for the master, prepared for every good work. And so I want to break these two verses down into their components. From this, um, there are five observations, five things that we can pick up from these two verses. All right? And I'm going to read them now very quickly, and then we're going to go into each one. First, the vessels are there in order that they may be used. Second, the vessels are really needed by the master. Third, the vessels are for different purposes. Fourth, the vessels that God uses must be available. And five, the vessels that God uses must be clean. So, um, let's go and look at the very first uh, one. The vessels are there in order that they may be used. All right, so I want you to picture in your mind's eye a great house. Now, obviously, the symbolism of the great house is, you know, the church is a great house. But I want you to picture your house, okay? There's vessel that you've got vessels in your house, do you not? All right, some of them may be for the dining room. Some of them may be for the kitchen. Some of them may be gold or silver. Some of them may be wood. Some of them may be clay. But they are there to be used. That's why you have them in your house. Christians are in the church for the same purpose. If you look at Ephesians 2.10, it tells us we are saved to serve. If you are saved and you don't, use your salvation you're not really serving a purpose you're hiding your talent in the ground the lord calls us not only to come to him that is found in matthew 11:28 but in matthew 28:19 he tells us to go out so we are to come to him, and then he sends us out. That's the Great Commission. God wants to use us. Sometimes when we are about to start some sort of Christian service, 
like a new women's breakfast, some other ministry. We often think about praying, Lord, help me. Lord, help me do this. But really what we should be praying is, Lord, use me. Because it is not what we are doing, the work with the Lord's help. Let me say that again. Because it is not we who are doing the work with the Lord's help, but the Lord who is doing the work through us. I'll say that again because I got so excited to ring the bell that I messed it up. Because it is not we who are doing the work with the Lord's help, It is the Lord doing the work through us. So we are vessels to be used. The second, the vessels are really needed by the master. All right. I want you to think and consider this. Your house again. Think of it with your kitchen, your dining room. And there's no utensils in it. There's no vessels in it. What are you going to have your coffee with? What are you going to have your water with? You're going to cup your hands? Your soda. You see, I really wanted to bring two soda cans. I wanted to put a can of Coke on one side and a can of Diet Dr. Pepper on the other side. And then Diet Dr. Pepper was going to be the vessel of honor and Coke was going to be the the vessel of dishonor. I'll get to that later. But anyway, so just consider you don't have anything to use. So these vessels are necessary, okay? Another way of saying that is you are necessary. We need them. It's the same for the church. And it's the same with our Lord. He needs vessels to perform His great purposes in the church and in the world. Now, I know God really doesn't need us. I know that. He could do whatever He wants. But I want to challenge you to think about any of the miracles that were done in the New Testament, were not every one of them done through someone? Like in the Old Testament, there was all kind of things happening that God didn't need a person, but He chooses now, at this time and at this place, to move through people, to do miracles through people. He needs vessels into which he can pour the treasure of his grace and love, men and women, whom he can use then for the spreading of the gospel. In 2 Kings 4, 1-7, there's a story. This is Elisha, okay? And there's a woman who's about to go bankrupt. And all she has left is one pot of oil that's getting ready to go away. And Elisha says, I want you to go out and borrow as many vessels as you possibly can from all your neighbors and all your friends. Okay? And then, I promise that the oil will never run out of that vessel. So, she went out and she did that. And her original pot of oil never ran out. And she filled all these other vessels with oil. Now, I want you to consider a few things. In the Bible, oil, when you see any reference to oil, oil is all the time a symbol for the Holy Spirit. We are vessels that hold the Holy Spirit in us. The world around us is bankrupt, but we are the vessels in which 
and through which God is wanting to pour the miracle of His grace so that the needs of men and women may be met. So the Lord has a very real need for you. He wants to use you just where He has placed you. In the home, the office, the factory, wherever it may be. He cannot do His work in the place where you are unless He can use you as a vessel of His grace. The third area, the vessels are for different purposes. Remember, it says some are gold, some are silver, some are wood, some are clay. They are all different because they are for different purposes. This applies in any household. And he has need of each kind in the church. He needs Paul's. He needs Peter's. He needs Andrew's. He needs Lydia's. Men like Matthew and women like Martha. It is an encouragement to notice that the Lord uses a great many ordinary vessels. In his first letter to the Corinthians, in chapter 1, verses 26 to 30, Paul speaks to this. But he states that God does not only use ordinary vessels. Some are extraordinary or extraordinary. Now, if you look at verse 26, I want to point something out to you. It does not say this. It does not say this. Not any of you were wise. Not any mighty. Not any noble are called. But it says not many. Not many of you were wise, not many mighty, not many noble are called. But not many means some were. So he does call some wise, some influential or mighty, and some noble people into his service. His service just isn't for common, everyday people. Daniel led, essentially, the government of Persia. He can use powerful people. We rejoice that the Lord uses a great variety of people. Fourth, the vessels that God uses must be available. I want you to look at verse 21, back up to verse 21. And we're going to break this verse down into some pieces here. All right, let me, um, let me reference it for you again. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from the latter, he will be a vessel for honor, sanctified and useful for the master, prepared for every good work. We're going to look at sanctified, useful for the master, and prepared for every good work. Sanctified. What does that mean? It means made holy and set apart for a holy purpose. In other words, made available for the Lord to use. Have you made your life available to the Lord? Are you at His disposal? So I want you to remember, available. The second, notice the phrase, useful to the Master, meaning ready for His use. Are you ready? It's different than available. Available means you're there, He can use you. But are you ready? That's different. You have to be ready. Instantly. When He calls, 
Are you ready? Third, prepared for every good work. Here's another way of saying it. Ready for anything. Available, ready for anything. I want to give you an example. If you look at Acts chapter 8, there's Philip the evangelist. At one point in the chapter, he's preparing to minister to a crowd of people. And then suddenly, verse 26, he's ready to speak to one person, reading a Bible, in a chariot, in the middle of the desert. Ready for anything. It is very important to notice there is one special condition that must be met before God can use us. It's the beginning of verse 21. And it's the last, which is the vessels that God uses must be clean. Verse 21 begins, Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself, after all, we would not want to use dirty utensils, would we? You're not sitting there in your dining room setting out a wonderful banquet for your friends and have in front of you dirty plates and dirty forks and dirty knives and spoons. You're not in your kitchen pouring yourself a glass of refreshing Coke or Diet Dr. Pepper into a dirty glass. God can use anyone or anything, but Scripture states those whom God uses must be clean. I want to challenge you at some point, go to your concordance and look up the word clean. I'm going to throw some phrases at you. In Psalm 51.10, we must have clean hearts to worship Him. In Psalm 24.4, we must have clean hands to work for Him. In Psalm 119.9, we must have clean feet to walk for Him. In Isaiah 6.5, we must have clean lips to speak for Him. Before God can use us, we must be cleansed from everything that is contrary to His will. Wrong associations or friendships, unclean habits, and from doubtful things. You know, sometimes we have a difficult time grasping the Word of God. We doubt what we read and see. Notice the words, if a man cleanses himself, we are to do the cleansing. The action is ours, not God. How many times do we wait for God to clean us? That's our job. So now I challenge you, in the time that I have remaining. How do we get clean? This goes beyond just being washed by the blood of Jesus, okay? Because I know that's, a, oh, hey, Jesus, he, he cleanses us. This is, this is beyond our salvation, all right? This isn't that state of how God looks at us. We have to do this. Remember, this is about living through the Holy Spirit. Paul calls, calls it walking in the Spirit. And that's where we go now to Galatians 5, 16 to 25. Some of you that have subheads, the subhead in the text is probably going to say walk in the Spirit. How much do we just gloss over that when we're talking about 
the fruit of the Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit is about walking, living in the Spirit. And I'm going to help walk you through that. So let's read the verse, shall we? I say then, walk in the Spirit, and you shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh. For the flesh lusts against the Spirit. They're against each other. And these are contrary to one another, so that you do not do the things that you wish. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. Now, the works of the flesh are evident, which are adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lewdness, idolatry, sorcery, hatred, contentions, jealousies, outbursts of wrath or anger, selfish ambitions, dissensions, heresies, envy, murders, drunkenness, revelries, and the like, of which I tell you beforehand, just as I also told you in the time past, that those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such there is no law. And those who are Christ have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live in the Spirit, let us also walk in the Spirit. Here we have a graphic example. The first part are the vessels of dishonor, and then we have the vessels of honor. Now, Paul is warning those in the church, Christians. The letter to Galatians was to the Christians, not to the heathens. 2 Timothy, in the great house, in the church, there are vessels of honor and vessels of dishonor. So, he said, if you walk in the flesh, if you're in the flesh, you're going to do all those things of the flesh. Vessel of dishonor. If you walk in the Spirit and live in the Spirit, you are a vessel of honor. Now, let me give you an example of this, all right? There's a book that I refer to quite often. It's called The Word for Every Day. And in that book, this is what it says about how to live with the fruit of the Spirit. Love is possibly the singular most important of the Christian graces. God is love, according to 1 John 4, 8. Love for us sent Jesus to the cross. When we return His love, then we can love one another. That's how to live in love. To live in joy. Joy emanating from our walk with the Lord helps us to maintain a cheerful disposition at all times. Happiness is determined by outward circumstances. But joy is based on the promises of God that will never fail. Peace comes from knowing Jesus which brings a quiet serenity to our hearts. It is a sweet knowing that God is in control and our lives are in His hands. Forbearance or long-suffering is to have a patient, contented spirit that bears personal injuries gracefully. If we walk in long-suffering and patience, God will bring us to perfection. And that's James 1.4. Kindness creates in us a mild manner and a kind, courteous, and sweet disposition. Right, Melissa? (laughs) Goodness 
will make us bless our enemies, return good for evil, and refrain from wrath and anger. The goodness of God leads to repentance, and that's Romans 2.4. Faithfulness comes from the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen, Hebrews 11.1. 1. And tells us to believe God when the circumstances tell us not to. For we walk by faith, not by sight. 2 Corinthians 5, 7. This is one of my strong points, right, Melissa? Gentleness is meekness, or the quality exemplified in Jesus when he thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation and took upon him the form of a servant humbled himself, and became obedient to death, which is Philippians 2.3. Meekness inclines us to govern our passions and resentment so that we are not easily provoked. If you watch Star Wars movies, you already know all of this. Use the force, Luke. Lastly, Self-control is temperance, which means to be moderate in all things except in service and service to and worship of God. This includes food, clothing, recreation, you know, soda. That's why I do Dr. Diet Dr. Pepper and not Coke. My heart wants Coke, but I will drink diet dr pepper there's an excerpt also from this book that i thought was so appropriate that i want to read it very quickly in the minutes i have left if we take the name of jesus christ we have a responsibility to live up to that name part of that responsibility is to keep peace and unity in the church and the body of christ Although they should by all means do so, Christian love and unity do not come naturally in a church or between Christian brothers and sisters. There is too much of the flesh to be dealt with and to be put under subjection. Paul tells us that such takes practice in the Christian graces. For example, we are to practice lowliness and meekness and long-suffering, forbearing one another in love. We must realize that the walk of Christianity is comprised of many components, walking together in one body, one spirit, one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, and one Father. To accomplish that kind of unity requires certainly that we practice a walk worthy of being Christian. Pride and selfishness destroy peace and create mischief. But humility and meekness restore peace and love. We really do not walk worthy of the vocation wherewith we are called if we are not meek and lowly in heart. Christians must also keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Christian unity is in the heart or spirit of Christians, and it comes from the Spirit of God. It is one of the fruits of the Holy Spirit. Peace is a bond that unites Christians together, even though they may differ in some points. But discord and quarreling will cause all manner of problems, which is James 3.16. Lastly, a church made up of slender twigs will become strong when those twigs are bound together in peace and love and unity. And surely the bond of peace is the strength of the church and the body of Christ. So I thought that was a different way of saying the same thing about using the fruit of the Holy Spirit in every day of our lives. So to wrap things up, there are some points that I want to touch on. And I said it earlier. In the great house, there are vessels of honor and vessel of, vessels of dishonor. 
That's why sometimes we have a problem getting along with each other. Okay? Because sometimes we're in the flesh, sometimes we're in the spirit. The more we're all in the spirit, the more we're all going to get along together. Second, Paul says he calls it fruit of the Holy Spirit, not fruits. You get them all. Okay? You have them all. This is allowing them to work through you. The reason why I wanted to get the Coke can and the Diet Dr. Pepper can, for me, the Diet Dr. Pepper can is the fruit of the Spirit. I've, I've got that. Holy Spirit comes in. I've got that. I'm carrying it. I'm letting the Holy Spirit use me. When I want to do the works of the flesh, I've got to put down the can of Diet Dr. Pepper, and I've got to pick up the can of Coke. If you're going to do something in the flesh, it's a willful act. And lastly, Our challenge is to remain constant, plugged in, connected, abiding in the Holy Spirit. This way we have a walk, living by the Holy Spirit, walking in the Spirit. Thank you all, and God bless.